let's go ahead and get get through a few things. Um, please in the chat, tell me uh, what why you're here, what you want to get out of the sessions. Uh, I will try to answer your questions as we go. There will be a couple of question breaks. And uh, I see you're all muted. That's great. Uh, please stay muted unless you've been asked to unmute during the Q&A. And uh, Janine will uh, uh, collect the questions and she will tell you uh, to unmute if, if we uh, need further information on your questions. So she'll be the one in charge of that. Please make sure your Zoom name is your actual name so that when I call on you, um, I, I know who you are. <laughs> uh, that that sometimes seems um, a silly thing, but my sister's uh, Zoom name is Nutty Crew, and and that's not really helpful. So uh, so these these are things that we have to we have to uh, remind people of sometimes. So uh, in answer your, to your question, the answer is yes. The deck, the notes, the recording will all be shared afterwards. Uh, if you are not currently in the UXR Guild Slack group please indicate in the chat that you want to be added, or if you prefer, you can email me privately at jillian at uxrguild.com. Uh, um, we do have an exclusive channel just for this conversation where I'll be sharing articles and resources, uh, some videos. There will be some video links in, in the meeting today. We'll watch one of those videos. It's a, it's a brief one. It's about six minutes long. It's really great. Um, and uh, those links will also be uh, put in the Slack group as well as this deck. And uh, I do like to share articles from time to time. So we will be able to continue the conversation after this is over. So um, I've already done that. Uh, so here's the recap. In the first session, uh, we talked about what is UX strategy. UX strategy, strategy equals the user plus the business. So that means the, um, you, you uh, as the researcher, you combine the user's needs with the business goals uh, to create projects that um, help both the user and the business and make you a successful researcher and a value to your company. Um, leadership is the UX strategies must speak about UX in the, the terms of in the business in their own language. So I'm sorry. My words are tripping over each other tonight, but you have to speak in the language of business uh, to the stakeholders. That is their language. You have to meet them where they are, just like you would with the user. Turn the, that lens on your on your business uh, stakeholders, and you want to speak to them in that language. That's the way to get through to them. Uh, leadership is not rank, so anyone and everyone can be a leader. Doesn't matter what your role is at the company. It doesn't matter what your rank is, it doesn't matter whether whether you're a junior researcher or if you are the uh, director of UX. Um, you can lead uh, and you should. Uh, management is right. And obviously you can't and shouldn't manage unless they give you the authority. But um, a lot of people can play those too. Uh, I consider myself a leader. I am not a manager. Uh, I, I unofficially, uh, I don't call it managing, I call it heavy mentoring of uh, the rest of the research team. Um, so that that is uh, was a brief summary of our very first session. So identifying and creating UX champions. Uh, we You have to create high quality UX research. This will not work if you're not putting your best work forward. Um, practice radical transparency. That's a new phrase that I, I've started using that I like a lot. With your stakeholders, what, what do I mean by that? You want to over communicate, share your um, share your research meetings with them, invite them to observe, um, make sure you, you invite them to all of your research presentations, make sure you send them the notes from the field, that kind of thing. Engage with whomever reacts the most positively to your research. That is how you identify a candidate to become a UX champion. It may not be someone on the C level at the beginning. It could be someone who uh, is a product owner, who's really excited about the work you're doing, that's great. And you meet with them and, and help them help you help them. Uh, that is not a typo. Um, that means that, you know, th if the relationship is reciprocal, uh, you know, they want to help you because they see that what you're doing is gonna help them with their projects, uh, with their goals. 
and everything. So that that's that reciprocal relationship. You're, you're working together to make yourselves um, most successful and for the benefit of the users in the company. Um, look for signs that they're evangelizing UX in the company. That's also a really good sign that uh, you, you've been doing your job and that they've gotten the message. Uh, so that is the recap on that. So congratulations, you've got a UX champion. Now what? Now what do you do with them? Um, as I mentioned, uh, the champions can be at multiple levels on the company org. And what you can accomplish with them may depend on where they sit on that org tree. And uh, you can work your way up, but uh, with a product owner, you know, work with them on attainable projects. So things that you know that you can make successful, that you can improve, um, that, that will also be a, a, ben, a, a value to both the user and the business. And then you make a, the projects a success and you both win. And I'm gonna show you this uh, science of persuasion um, coming up here in a moment. And um, so that you can see that um, how you can sort of um, talk to these people and influence them and, and, and get them to work with you. Won't work with everybody. There are always a couple people at every company that just don't wanna go with the program. Um, but work with the ones that will work with you and who have viable projects that, that meet that criteria, that it's, it's a win, 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 win. Everybody wins. That's what you're looking for. And then just be loud. Uh, make, make everybody aware of uh, the work that you're doing, the work that you're doing together, how awesome they are working with you, uh, you know, all, all of the chances you have to provide kudos and and all of that in, within the company and praise within the company. Um, be seen being generous uh, because that uh, is something that will reward you later on because then they'll feel the need to do the other. And that again is part of the science of persuasion and we'll get to that later. Um, when you're dealing with someone who is several levels above you, like a VP of sales or you know some other high level uh, business stakeholder, uh, the way to work with them the best is to demonstrate to them the ROI in fixing some of the user's pain points that will also help the VP meet some of their goals. So you can be more direct with them, um, but you've got to show them the ROI, you know, that if we fix this, and, and most of my projects have been about making our internal users more productive. So making, for the VP of sales, making our sales team more productive. So I can eliminate some things that are inefficient in their work processes by improving our app, then they can go out there and sell more. And that's what you wanna do. You wanna make sure that uh, you're, you're, you get some, some ROI stats around that, find someone who's good at it if you're not. It really is just saying, hey, you know, in my research, I've discovered that this takes them on average five minutes to do. And if we fix this one thing, we can get it down to two minutes. So they do this thing a hundred times a day. You know, if we can shave three minutes off of that, a hundred times a day is probably too many, but um, you know, find out what the math works. And that's how you get them to the point where uh, you can see that they can sell more if we re remove the inefficiencies, that kind of thing. You'll be able to find those. Uh, your research will point the way when you're talking to your, if it's a customer, removing any impediments to, to their, their ability to purchase, um, if it's you know a, a customer user, someone who doesn't have the purchasing authority but is using it, it's the same thing. Find out ways you can smooth it out and make it easier for them. Um, that also uh, solves a problem. Um, we hear from customers all the time uh, that make certain demands uh, on things that are pain points for them. They're not shy. Find find a way to make a solution for that. That. Um, and you know you, you definitely will get on the, the VP of sales good side or whoever it is that you're talking about. So the science of persuasion, this is a, um, a book by Robert, uh, I think it's Collini. I, I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce his name. He wrote it in 1984. And it is um, something that these, these six, sort of ideas around how you can work with people and persuade them to your side. And um, 
this book was presented to me first by um, a Nielsen Norman class I took, a Nielsen Norman group class I took. And what she said was, don't read the book. He's not really talking about using them ethically, but they really do work when you are being authentic and you are using them ethically. So um, there's a YouTube link here. We're not going to watch it. It's like about 12 minutes, but um, it goes through these, uh, these six points. So reciprocity, I talked about that a moment ago. That is, uh, you create an obligation to give when you receive. So, you know, be the first person to give, give generously, make it personalized and, and surprising, unexpected. And uh, they will want to uh, give back. That's, you know, praising each other so that you, you're both elevated in, in the eyes of the company. Um, scarcity. People want more of the things they, that they uh, can have less of. Uh, so focus on the unique benefits and what they stand to lose. I don't tend to work with that one uh, unless you're talking about lack, lack of headcount, which is a huge problem in my company. Authority. People will follow the lead of credible, knowledgeable experts. So signal to uh, others what makes you an expert before you uh, attempt to influence. This is also a key one. If you make yourself an authority on research and strategy within your company and everything, you automatically have more credibility. And especially as you start to gain these uh, UX champions, uh, it, especially if they're high up in the company, um, that the higher they are, the more authority that, that reflects on you. So you can use that to your benefit. Um, and, and it's awesome, especially if they're out there saying, go talk to X because he and she knows which, what they're doing in this space. And so now you've got um, the reciprocity aspect going too, because you've got someone in authority uh, reflecting your own authority and um, you know, this praise on you that, that gives you the ability to, to do the work that you want to do. Uh, consistency. People like to be consistent uh, with their previous behaviors and actions. So if you ask them to do something small uh, before you make the bigger request, but as long as it's, it's an escalation of the, of the same request, uh, they're more likely to do it. Um, and there's a great example of that in the video. Uh, liking, we respond to people who uh, are like us, who compliment us, cooperate with us, that kind of thing. So seek common ground. And this is where you really do have to be genuine because if you're fake with this, it will backfire mm -hmm. hugely. And consensus, people are looking to the actions of others to determine their own. That's sort of the, uh, like the, if your peers are doing it, then you know, you'll wanna do it. So those are the six points. And at this point, I'm going to stop and uh, ask if there are any questions or anything anyone wants to, to bring up. Anybody? Janine? Well, your... um, uh, Josephine, <laughs> Josephine has a question in the chat okay. that I'll just refer to. Okay. Thank you. You want me to regenerate it? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have real, because I'm presenting, I don't have really good controls over, over the Zoom. No worries. So basically the question was, uh, when you're starting with a new team mm -hmm. and let's say some of the stakeholders are product managers and product owners, mm -hmm. um, does it make sense to carve out, say, a block of time to go over a list of activities like the ones in, there's a, Nielsen Norman Group survey an article on the subject to find out what their expectations are as to who is responsible for what. Um, and I should say I've been in conversations and in job interviews where product owners and product managers didn't seem that open to discussing such types of divisions in advance. And obviously these can get pretty detailed. You know, there are dozens of activities that could be discussed. So are you talking more like a racy or are you just talking in general? About uh, well, I'm thinking of the Nielsen Norman article where mm -hmm. they did a survey of um, expectations of like- Oh, between UX and product? Right. Yeah, yep. I, okay. I, it's been a while since I've read that one. If you've got the link and you can put it in the chat, I think that that would be awesome for everybody. Yeah, yeah um, let me do that right now. Yeah, I, I think everybody should read that. That that's a great article. Um, I I would say that's not what I would lead with. I would my personal 
way of working is I would lead with the assumption that everybody um, wants to work together towards a common goal. And um, what I would lead with when you're working with a new group and a new product team and everything is sort of, you know, try to have a chat with them one-on-one. -on -one. What, what are you working on? What, what are your pain points in trying to do this? Uh, how can I help you? Um, and that's sort of what you want to do when you get this one-on-one -on -one with any stakeholder. Um, and what's, what's been fascinating to me is when I have these types of conversations, there was one in a, the first one-on-one -on -one I had, we both said at the same time, how can I help you? <laughs> it was, it, you know, the stakeholder wa wanted to help me. I wanted to help them. Uh, and that's what I meant by helping, uh, you know, helping me help them help, help me. Um, we both were very eager to have this working relationship be beneficial. So they were very eager to help me. So I, I would go in assuming that your, um, whoever you're gonna meet with wants to work with you to be successful until they prove otherwise. And, you know, again, if, if, if they're not going to be cooperative and they, they are, you know, there are bad actors every once in a while, and it's unfortunate, but it happens, uh, you know, you just help them as best as they will allow and, and get, spend more of your energy uh, with the people who are more cooperative and want to work with you. And I would say, I would save this, um, this article on, on the PM uh, UX uh, differences thing. If you feel like you have enough of a rapport that you can then say, hey, um, I want to make sure that, you know, we're working as, as efficiently and cooperatively as we can. Um, you know, are you open to having that kind of conversation? And then you go into it. But you start off with the assumption that they do want to work with you and they do want to uh, benefit from having a close collegial working relationship with you. And and because uh, I feel like this article, while it's very uh, honest about what the differences are and it presents both sides, it doesn't really, it, it can seem really confrontational. I wouldn't want to lead with it. Um, I would sort of you, you know, keep that in my back pocket in case we needed to get there. But ultimately, um, I think it's really just good for our own, uh, reading the article for our own um, understanding of the dynamics that might be going on. And if you remember, I put in the Slack group because uh, Josephine's a diehard. She's been in every session. I, I remember her. Um, and she always asks great questions. But um, I did put a link into a uh, communication style uh, quiz, and it talks about how you do the different communication styles. That is something that you want to go back to uh, and uh, figure out who, what the communication style is of the person you're dealing with and figure out how you can communicate to them. This is more than just speaking the language of business to business stakeholders. This is, I personally have this type of uh, communication style and um, I'm going to respond better to someone who understands my communication style and meets me there. Uh, it's going to make me more comfortable. Uh, I'm going to be more receptive to what they have to say. And it's all about, I, I call this turning the, the UX lens in, inside. Uh, it's not about the users, it's about the user experience of working together on a product team, you know, between UX and product and business and engineering and QA and all of those other people, uh, you have to sort of keep that lens on and no matter who you're dealing with. Does that fully answer your question, Josephine? Very <laughs> much hit the nail on the head. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Nicole, are you with us? She's on, she's muted. Um, well, I, we could ask her question, but I didn't, would want her to be on to hear it. Yeah, so. well, I, I can see the question. Oh, she doesn't have oh, a mic. Oh, she doesn't have a mic. Okay, so her I, question, you can see it? 
I can see it. Um, Perfect. Josephine said rolled up a little bit, so I couldn't see it. I, I'm afraid to touch anything <laughs> in, in case the, the, the presentation goes around. Um, but she wants to know how you can build authority while still making uh, your own mistakes and encouraging people to be comfortable sharing your thoughts with you. Well, that is, um, we talked about that a little bit with um, sort of like the, the people who are like you kind of thing. They make mistakes too. So just own it. Um, you know, I was screwed up orally a minute ago because I couldn't read my own deck. Uh, and, but does it make me less an authority? No, it makes me human. Uh, so you want to make sure that um, you just own it. Oh, I, I made a flub. Uh, you know, let me start over again. Uh, ha ha, you know, move on. Uh, but when, if you're talking about making a bigger mistake, like I really made a mistake on this research and I, I need to fix it before we go down a wrong path. I actually did that um, about a month ago. Uh, I completed some research and I presented it. And about a week later, I realized, you know, I really didn't hit this one point that I really needed to. So I fixed the deck, I uploaded the new deck, and then I sent an email out to people and said, hey, um, you know, there was this one point, um, this research that I did uh, on this one point and everything, and, and the research didn't go as well as we had hoped it would. People didn't understand what we were doing, um, but, and I didn't give you a recommendation on how to proceed, uh, and I want to do that now. So I, I want to tell you that, um, even though they didn't understand the terminology we were using, uh, it was learnable and they didn't seem to be bothered that they didn't understand it. At this point, I really don't have a, uh, a proposed solution for you. I, I would just say we're at risk of some people not understanding it and we need to monitor the situation. Uh, so that is my advice going forward. And I got a lot of thank you emails from it. They said, yeah, that's really a really good point. We understand, you know, we, we haven't mitigated the risk, fully mitigated the risk here because we don't have a solution. Uh, and, um, you know, I didn't lose authority because of that. And especially because I came forward before anybody else told me I didn't make a mistake. That's, I think that's an important thing um, is if you can um, make, you know, if you can admit your mistake before anybody else gets a chance to, you're coming from a place of power. So that is a, a good way to, um, say that, hey, you know, you know, I, 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 I messed up, but, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to fix it now. And, I, you know, it, it works. It really does. Uh, it is. It's also showing that you're honest and that you're ethical and that you're trustworthy. So I think that that's, um, that's super important uh, along with the authority that, and, and that just makes you even more of an authority later on because, um, they know that you're always going to give them the best advice that you have, even if it comes, you know, a week after the fact. So um, I, I, I would give that a shot. And you better believe it. I, I am a transparency person and an over communicator. It has served me well. Um, and people know where I stand. So there, there's no ambiguity there. So do we have any other questions? Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. So um, I've been practicing this for three years. So three years on, um, I have become a trusted uh, resource and that's what you wanna do. You want to be a trusted resource to your champions. Um, be a sounding board and a brainstorming partner when they're thinking through a business problem that they're having. Um, I, I've been doing that a lot lately, and I've been more self-aware of it since I started giving these lectures uh, about it. So it's something that um, is really fascinating to me to see how the dynamics have changed. Um, I hear about new initiatives when it's still something that the stakeholders just thinking about. Uh, this is so much better than when you go into a meeting where they're doing plan, you know, quarterly planning or what have you and you get hit with five projects that you knew nothing about. Uh, this allows you to, um, to be flexible in your research planning and to know what's coming, uh, giving you a much longer runway in order to be able to accommodate it all. Um, it's been an insane year for me and I shifted my research around to where I was able to cover more topics because we're understaffed. And I'll get to that in a minute. 
but knowing what was coming and having the appropriate amount of runway has allowed me to increase the projects that I was able to cover from eight last year to 21 this year. And some of those 21 were projects that I started. They were research-led initiatives. And that's where we're gonna to get to towards the end with that is to make sure that uh, you understand how they do it. It's, it. it's an insane workload. It's not for everybody, but it's definitely effective. And uh, based on my conversations in our one-on-one -on -one meetings, I can create research and project initiatives that meet the business concerns and the user's needs. That's the crux of the whole UX strategy. That's where you want to be. So if you can, you know, cover those two groups and you can um, do plan the research and have control over your own research so that you can uh, ask uh, perform the research that you want to do on the topics that you think need to be covered. You know, pain points that you see that nobody's acting on. Nobody in product is coming to you and saying, let's fix this. And you see it as a problem. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about the way that I have done this so that I can uh, create research on topics that I think are important for our users and our business and then present them as projects. And that's, that's what you can do with this. This is how powerful it is. But before we go into that, I want to introduce you to this amazing video. And some of you may have seen it. Um, it is, um, we're gonna talk next about uh, a long-term roadmap. And that's another thing that you can do with uh, your stakeholders. And it's a process that I've been involved in for about a year and a half with my stakeholders. And, you, what you want, and Jared Spool calls this an envisionment, and I don't know where he came up with that term. Um, what it, uh, spell check keeps trying to correct it when I put it in, so it's not, it's not, it's a made-up word. But um, back in 1987, and yes, this video is that old. Um, Apple released a video for something that that was an envisionment for them. It was a product that they wanted to create. And uh, you know the video is really old. The resolution isn't great. And uh, Janine and I tried it earlier with the audio, and we'll see see if we get if if it's if the audio is not working. I the link is in the deck, and you can watch it later on. But it's about six minutes, so I want you to watch this, and um, we will uh, definitely talk about it afterwards. And I'm surprised it's not starting. Oops. I swear this worked before. <laughs> it was. Yeah, I yeah. know. <laughs> oh, there we go. Do you want to make it large screen, full screen? It won't get any better. Team in Guatemala, just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father's surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 415 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Go look all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm -hmm. Fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact you. I'm sorry, she's not available right now. I left a message that you had called. 
Okay. Let's see. There's an article about five years ago, Dr. Clemson or something. He really disagreed with the direction of Jill's research. John Fleming of Uppsala University. He published in the Journal of Earth Science of July 20 of 2006. Yes, that's it. He was challenging Jill's projection of the amount of carbon dioxide being released in the atmosphere through deforestation. I'd like to recheck his figures. Here's the rate of deforestation he predicted. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Hmm. He was really off. Give me the university research network. Show only universities with geography nodes. Show Brazil. Copy the last 30 years at this location at one month intervals. Excuse me, Jill Gilbert is calling back. Great, put it through. Hi, Mike. What's up? Jill, thanks for getting back to me. Well, I guess that new grant of yours hasn't dampened your literary abilities. Rumor has it that you've just put out the definitive article on deforestation. Aha. Uh -huh. Is this one of your typical last minute panics for lecture material? No, 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 no. That's not until um 415. <laughs> It's about the effects that reducing the size of the Amazon rainforest can have outside of Brazil. I was wondering, though, it's not really necessary, but. Uh, mm, yes. It would be great if you were available to make a few comments. Nothing formal. After my talk, you would come up on the big screen, discuss your article, and then answer some questions from the class. And bail you out again? Well, I think I could squeeze that in. You know, I have a simulation that shows the spread of the Sahara over the last 20 years. Here, let me show you. Nice. Very nice. I've got some maps of the Amazon area during the same time. Let's put these together. Great. I'd like to have a copy of that for myself. Yeah. What happens if we bring down the logging rate to 100,000 acres per year? Hmm. Interesting. I can definitely use this. Thanks for your time, Jill. I really appreciate it. No problem. But next time I'm in Berkeley, you're buying the dinner. Dinner, right. See ya, 4.15. Bye-bye. While you were busy, your mother called again to remind you to pick up the birthday cake. Fine, fine, fine. Um, I'm just out of the point, huh? Now printing. Okay, I'm going to lunch now. If Kathy calls, still I'll be there at 2 o'clock. Also, find out if I can set up a meeting tomorrow morning with um, Tommy. Enjoy your lunch. Hello, Professor Bradford is away at the moment. Would you like to leave a message? Michael, this is your mother. I know that you're there. I just call in to remind you. All right. So um, that was a little weird um the, the voices got out of sync uh there towards the end but um the the fascinating thing about that is that video was created a good 20 years before the iphone came out uh and before siri and before ipads and all of that so uh you know when you're talking about uh with your stakeholders about a long-term vision. This is this is an example that you can give to them that, you know, if they, you know, when when Apple did this in 1987, they did not know how to create any of these things. They did not know the technology that we would that would it would take to build these things. But they had a vision of where they wanted to go. 
And you can use that same idea, try and jazz up your stakeholders to think long-term uh, in planning where they want to go. And, and all I asked my, my stakeholders uh, was, uh, where, where do we want the company to be in five years? Um, and they're like, can, can we do three years? And I'm like, no. Uh, because in three years, you might be able to guess what what, tech, what we could do technologically. I don't want you to think about that. I want you to think longer. You can do five or eight, and they chose five. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and that really got them jazzed. And I got them together. So I had I have three main stakeholders, and I got them together in the room. Uh, they're very, they work very well together, and they're very uh, close. Uh, I call them the three amigas. And... Um, so I got them together and I just sort of took notes on everything that they said. I put it in a spreadsheet of all the goals that they had. At this point, we were in 2021. So we were saying, where do we want to be at the end of 2026? And uh, they, they told me on different levels what they, what they wanted to accomplish. And that was the first step to get them not thinking about uh, what, can we what can we accomplish with the resources we have today, but, you know, throw all of that out what where do we want to be and uh use that as a way to get them to then reverse engineer these long-term goals so okay if this is where we want to be in 2026 what do we need to accomplish this year in order to make it to that goal and some companies are better at this my company they were like wow we've been wanting to do this forever we didn't know how to do it and you brought us how to do it. This is also a Nielsen Norman class that I took. Uh, they used uh, a theme roadmap, uh, which I built out in, in a, just a spreadsheet. You can take all the columns that are in the theme and drop them in a spreadsheet and then uh, start, start annotating. Uh, it can be just that simple. You don't need special software or anything else to do it. But because I brought them this, this solution for this pain point that they were having of trying to make this long-term plan, uh, that gave me more authority and that, that gave me uh, more uh, more of a win because I, I worked with them and I have continued to work with them over a year and a half now on this. And, um, you know, we're in January going to take another look at, um, you know, we're now starting 2022. So what do we want, uh, excuse me, 2023, what do we want 2028 to look like? Uh, we're going to, we're going to extend it out. And then we're going to talk about what do we want to accomplish in 2023. That is that shifting perspectives on what they want to accomplish and what's top of mind for them that you can use when you're planning your research. So no matter what the project is that you're researching or the user group you're researching, you know where your business stakeholder wants to be uh, uh, with, with that group. He, the goals that he or she has around that particular user group and what you can, then you can start to think about it and craft these long-term uh, projects that you can do to sort of get them to that goal. And that's how, how you win. That, that, that is literally it. That is what led me to start shifting the way that I do um, my research, shifting it away from projects and shifting it towards user groups. I'm going to interview this user group uh, what do we need to talk to them about? Well, I've got the stakeholders on your list I'm, and I've got product telling me that we're going to be working on these projects in, in uh, here in the next quarter. So, you know, we're working with the sales team um, and we're going to work on the order form or we're going to work on, um, you know, whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, I also know that the stake, you know, the stakeholders want them to, you uh, hit these other goals and everything. So how can I beef up that research uh, to get information towards those larger goals that the stakeholder has and, and still support the, these ongoing projects? So that's where you get to um, the strategic discovery, which is what I have used over the past year. And I have to tell you, it's, it's a gauntlet if you decide to take it on. Uh, uh, I, it's basically continuous research. Uh, so you, uh, but I, I focused not on the, a single project in a research study, but on a user persona. So I, I want to talk to this user persona or series, like 
for the sales team. We have a sales manager, we have a sales rep, and then we have a sales assistant. That's three personas. Um, and how are they doing the, these tasks that we're about to change on? And what are their pain points around all these things that I know the stakeholders want to be doing? And, and how, how can I help uh, improve things for these users uh, that will get the stakeholders what they want? That's what I'm focused on when I'm planning these research projects. And as I told you, I was able to, to increase my coverage for eight projects to 21. And what that meant is, what I meant by that is when I talk to, let's, I'm gonna keep using the example of the sales team. Uh, when I talk to them, I might talk to them about, you know, pain points they're having on an order form. Uh, and uh, I might show them some designs that we have on um, the customer profile. And I might, you know, I'm, I'm talking to them about three or four different initiative ideas, but the, the, the I will say that the downside is that you don't have to go as in depth. And, and I would definitely go more in depth if we had a larger headcount in the research team, we don't. Uh, so this was sort of my solution to being able to um, at least get them some initial research to get them started off right and work very closely with my designer to get the designs right. Uh, if you're lucky enough uh, that you have, you're working at a place that has a large headcount and you can really focus in, I, I, this would be even more powerful. Um, I, I work with a research re, uh, repository now, so we're putting all of this in the research repository so that we can then pull and synthesize all this data later on when they're ready to work on it. Uh, we're working on a project right now that I proposed in 2019, and we're just now getting to it. So uh, no research should be left behind, and uh, no research should be um, forgotten because just because it's taken you a long time to get uh, the stars to align to be able to work on it. But that is what you can do with a business stakeholder, uh, a champion, someone who uh, has got your back, who's uh, helping you to be successful at the company. You, you try and work with them, get them on uh, the roadmap. If they have a roadmap, uh, ask them to invite you in. If, if you have their trust, invite you in so that you can see the roadmap and you can talk to them about you know, their planning and so forth so that you can help them with the existing roadmap uh, just to, to make sure that they're, they're covering all their bases. One of the things that I saw in the roadmap is a lot of the things that they wanted to do would require us to dramatically improve the quality of our development team, shall I say. Uh, so that, that was an important part. And it wasn't something that they were thinking of, but I was like, you know, if you wanna do this, this, and this, we really need to talk about the head of engineering and start talking about getting these skill sets on our engineering team so that we can do this and have someone who would know how to do this because we do not have it today. Um, so that's that's these are the types of conversations you can have. And this is where brainstorming with them makes a difference because they would not have thought of that on themselves until you know year three of the five year plan with, where the uh, the head of tech said, no, we, we don't know how to do this. We can't do this and shuts them down. Um, that's not what you're going for. You want to be the person who can can see the holistic picture and help help them towards success, even if it means talking about um, what needs to happen with other groups. And these are one on ones and they're, they're, they're almost confessional. Uh, you know, what, what happens in the one on one stays in the one on one. Uh, so we uh, you know, it's it's important that uh, with that trust there and everything that you know we can we can be honest with each other. But uh, that's how you get to what I consider the ultimate goal of research-led projects, um, to where you're shifting that. I I can tell you right now we have two research-led projects that are actively being developed right now, and three more in the works that are uh, are planned for. Uh, December and on into Q1 uh, one of next year. So this is a very powerful thing. It puts you uh, in a really good position to be able to um, drive improvement for your users, make your stakeholders happy, all of the above. So that is my presentation to you. That is what I have discovered thus far that you can do with UX champions once you have them. So 
questions. We have 10 minutes left, so I want to give you guys a chance to, to ask those. I've stunned you guys in the silence. You have nothing to ask. Well, then I actually have a question for you. Uh, this is the last um, this is the last session at, for the, this topic of leveling uh, leveling up your UX strategy. So what would you like to see happen next? Uh, do you want to see me expand on this topic uh, in 2023? Uh, do you want me to repeat it later on in 2023 for those of you who didn't get to participate the first uh, in the first couple of sessions? Does anybody have any any thoughts on how that should go? Okay, y'all are being very quiet today. So uh, I guess that uh, Apple video really sent you guys on the silence. <laughs> Oh, uh, Josephine made a comment. She'd like to hear more about strategic planning. Okay, expand on that, Josephine. What uh, what do you mean by the planning? Are you talking about the uh, the roadmap planning with the stakeholders? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So I was just typing. I'm not. I'm going to stop typing. Okay. Um, well. You know, I've been reading a number of articles lately about um, strategic planning, and uh, I read recently an article from nineteen from uh, two thousand and nineteen by Amy Webb mm -hmm. on uh, strategic planning, like a futurist. And um, you know, these days, um, and it's been going on for a couple of years now. You know, there's increasing, you know, VUCA volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity in all organizations are affected to varying degrees. So I would love to hear um, more about UX strategy when, you know, we and our stakeholders are all dealing with so much uncertainty. That article I mentioned about uh, planning like a futurist, I found very interesting. Uh, Amy Webb talks about uh, instead of a timeline, you know how organizations you know, they pick a five year plan, like you said yeah. in New York. Well, Amy Webb talks about it a little differently. She talks about a, a cone. And yeah. instead of picking a year that ends in a five or a zero down mm -hmm. the road, she, she recommends that we change our relationship to time and we uh, move the cone along on a daily basis. Oh, yeah. and, and and she talks about um, planning short term and long term simultaneously, which Definitely. kind of goes against yeah. our biological <laughs> walk. Right. So and I think that if you want to talk about strategy, UX strategy, um, dealing with uncertainty, anything yeah. in that department, I think you could probably talk about that every month for all of 2023 and oh God. Think no okay. one would be unhappy <laughs> well i would i will tell you that the um the ux roadmap i didn't talk about it in in depth uh because there's a whole class around it with nelson Norman, but it is a living roadmap so it's not something that you do once and revisit you know in five years or even in just a year uh, we actually had monthly meetings about it because it's a living roadmap and things change. We actually spun off uh, from our main company um, uh, at the beginning of November. So, you know, that has dra dramatically changed it. And when we meet again in, in January, that is what we're gonna have to cover is now that we've spun off, how does that change our roadmap? And, uh, you know, if somebody gets a brilliant idea and, and they wanna pick up on it and everything, um, <coughs> you know, how does that change the roadmap if we decide to, to slot this thing up higher that, that we weren't planning on doing at all? 
how do, how do we do that and what how does that change the roadmap what gets pushed down uh, these are all very important conversations and everything uh, that you have to have when you're doing this kind of thing um, and it's it's meant to be a living document and it's meant to um, to uh, be an ongoing conversation. Uh, I will tell you, we have not been 100% successful in meeting all the goals we set for ourselves for the year 2022. Obviously, at the beginning of 2022, we were not planning on spending off. So that's one thing. But what I have noticed, which has been remarkable, is that just the act of planning for the future, for a long-term future, has shifted the way the stakeholders think about the projects. They are now thinking more long-term and more strategically. Whereas before what I was noticing, and it was super frustrating for me because I couldn't plan research very well, is that you know we would have these one quarter planning sessions. So we were planning like a month before the quarter started, we were planning on what we were gonna do that quarter. That does not give me an up runway to be able to do the research on all the projects that the, the engineering teams are gonna be working on that quarter. Um, and it was driving me crazy. And I felt like every quarter, it was just like a whole new world. We weren't building on anything we've done before. We were just constantly being reactive to whatever was going on. And I felt like instead of you know drawing a line somewhere, we kept drawing an asterisk. It was one quarter, it was one quarter long and we kept drawing lines all, all in the same spot. Uh, so we just weren't getting any of that. So, uh, you know, getting them to think more long term and everything was really a way to save my own sanity uh, in trying to get them to uh, to focus on that. And again, it was something that they wanted to do. They were ready to do. They just didn't know how to do it. Um, and it really is something that UX is uniquely qualified to do because of that ability to turn that lens inside and sort of meet them where they are and fix it as a pain point. Thank you for sharing that link, that's great. I'm gonna actually have to take a look at that uh, after we get off this session. But I would be happy to talk more about strategic planning and go deeper into that. Um, and I would actually say, um, we could at this point turn it more into a group discussion because I would be learning too. You know, I can be the moderator, but we can all bring things to the table. And Josephine, I know that you would show up and you know, you, you have a chance to put in put in uh, your thoughts and, and what, what you think, and then we can have it be a true discussion. Everybody reads the article and brings their own thoughts, and we can just have it really be an honest to goodness discussion group. Yes, I also believe everybody should be able to share their challenges and everything. We have been treating this as more of a presentation and then a Q&A, but um, I really do honestly want to hear what everybody else is experiencing uh, one of the I've been um, first of all I, one of the things I want to do is to present this um, this talk uh, to a larger group I've been looking for conferences where I could present this talk uh, next year and we'll see if I'm able to manage that but um, you know what I find when I go to these conferences and these kinds of presentations and everything is um, everybody's in the same boat. Everybody thinks that they're falling behind and they're not doing as well as everybody else. Then you go to these conferences and you realize, oh, I'm having the same challenges everybody else is having. We're all in this together. And so I think we can all benefit from uh, learning from, from each other and, and each other's experiences and not just uh, you know sharing them, but also helping each other through them. Uh, so if you know if you're like, has anybody dealt with X and how did you get through it? You know, we can share our experiences and we can keep going uh, in more of a free format. Uh, I, I would be very happy with that. Uh, I do want to talk to learners. Learners is at the top of my list. I really do like their their video format where it's, it's really like a 50 minute talk and then Q&A and it's a really short. Uh, format. Uh, I will have to learn how to either speak a lot faster or I will have to tear this down a bit in order to do that because it's been uh, three separate uh, conversations. But I really think that um, when I first thought about how to create a UX champion and everything, 
Uh, it's actually a blog article I created. It was, it was how to create a UX champion using research bait. Uh, and that was, that was the blog article that I wrote. And I wrote it because everybody talks about the need to have a, 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 a UX champion. Nobody tells you how to get one. And then nobody tells you what to do once you've got one. It, it doesn't make you not a free UX champion. I don't want to get into that. I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> but I like the way you think. But, um, but um, everyone thinks that once you have a UX champion, everything works great. I went to a company once uh, where they, they swore that we had a UX champion up at the sea level. And then the guy came to give a talk and he started talking about how UX... Um, uh, made us deliver things faster. I thought, oh my God, he's got us confused with agile. That is not what UX does. We do not help you deliver things faster. We help you deliver things better. Mm -hmm. And so I was just flabbergasted. I was like, I got here under false pretenses. This guy is not a champion. He doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to UX. And I was, I was just so dumbfounded and, and upset. Um, but um, but yeah, that's, I think that there's, there's a way we can all help each other and, and I'm happy to continue that conversation. So I will definitely present it, um, to, to the board and see, uh, what we want to do. I don't know. Janine might have a better, uh, idea of what the plans are for 2023. Uh, if, if there's been any discussion yet on, on how we're going to proceed with the groups. Um, I don't know a whole lot more than you, but okay. we're, we're getting there. <laughs> so. okay. Well, we are at the top of the hour now, so I want to thank you all for attending. I thought this was a great conversation, and I want to keep it going. So again, if you want to join the Slack group, email me. Uh, uh, you know, you can uh, send a message to Janine, uh, send it to me, put it in, in the chat. Uh, we will make sure you get in. We've had a hard time in the past lining up the uh the names with the email addresses so um if you uh we want to make sure we get everybody in and match everybody up but if you, you want to be in there we're very happy to um to uh have you join you'll have access to the previous recordings uh and all the notes and all the quizzes and all the articles and all the conversation so uh we'd be happy to see you there but i'm gonna turn it back over to janine to close us out and and um Want to wish you guys Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whichever holiday you celebrate, just go go and celebrate, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. All right, thank you, thank you so much for those of you who've come. Um, I put in the evaluation form again. Um, there is a Slack, uh, an invite just to the Slack uh, UXR Guild channel, so you can click on that, and then the um, website there. So. Um, please keep uh, us in mind and uh, watch out, watch for um, upcoming um, sessions. And we do have a monthly email that we send out with what's coming up. Um, if you would like to be on that email, if you would put your, um, you can, let me put my email here. Um, and you can email me directly to add yourself to that. Um, and that's something that we send out to hundreds of people let me make sure i spelled that right yeah um and um that would probably be your best place to find us so anyway thank you so much for coming we look forward to having you back for another session